Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mike Pesco, a tobacco control researcher at Georgia State University. TOPS is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco, and Xi Sheng from the Ohio State University. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. Joseph Sabia will lead a traditional single, single paper presentation entitled, Do State Tobacco 21 Laws Work? Dr. Sabia is a professor of economics and founding director of the Center for Health Economics and Policy Studies at San Diego State University. He's an applied microeconomist with interests in labor economists, public economics, and the economics of risky health behaviors. Sabia's research has been published in leading economics, public health, and medical journals. His research on tobacco control policies has explored the impact of cigarette taxes on youth smoking, the role of the informal social market in insulating youth from tobacco control efforts, and the spillover effects of marijuana policy on tobacco use. Prior to his uh, current directorship, Sabia held faculty appointments at the University of Georgia, American University, the University of New Hampshire, and the U US Military Academy at West Point. Our discussant today is Catherine McLean. Dr. Sabia will be presenting his research in three segments. We'll have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Sabia, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you so much for the invitation to uh, be here today. Thanks especially to, to, to Mike, Catherine, and, and Justin for helping to organize this. So, sorry, I, I'm unable to share. Uh, Give me a sec, I will. Sure. Okay, try, try now, apologies. Yes, now it should be. Okay, everybody see that all right? Outstanding. Looks good. Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. So this work is joint with Ben Hansen at the University of Oregon, uh, with Drew McNichols, a former postdoc at the center and uh, now working at Amazon, and with Cal Bryan, who's a, a PhD candidate at Colorado State University. And in this paper, my co-authors and I uh, examine whether statewide Tobacco 21 laws are effective at uh, curbing smoking among youths and young adults. So first, uh, by way of disclaimer, this, this research was supported uh, by the Center for Health Economics and Policy Studies at, at San Diego State, which has included uh, research grant support for postdoctoral fellows and graduate students from the Troche Family Foundation and the Charles Koch Foundation. Uh, we don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to report. So by way of, of motivation, and this group certainly doesn't need uh, too, too much of this, so I won't, I, I won't belabor it. Uh, tobacco use is the leading uh, cause of preventable death in the United States, responsible uh, for diminished respiratory function, increased risk of stroke, cancers of the liver, head, colon, and lung, and, and, and increased risk of heart disease are responsible for nearly half a million deaths uh, per year. Uh, estimates of the social costs of tobacco use are, are also substantial, both in terms of direct healthcare costs, uh, as well as uh, externality related costs, say uh, due to the health costs of exposure to, to secondhand and thirdhand uh, tobacco smoke. Now we know that the vast majority of adult smokers initiate as youths with a mean age of initiation of, of 15. And this raises from, from an economist's perspective, we sort of want to think about what are the, what are the social welfare uh, rationales for policy intervention to affect the uh, tobacco use of uh, young adults and, and youth. So there's a few reasons we might want to care aside from sort of equity and distributional reasons, but for efficiency reasons. Uh, one is because 
Uh, youth and young adult smokers may be less likely to be rationally addicted uh, to tobacco. Uh, that is, youth smokers may be more likely to have time and consistent preferences and put insufficient weight on the future costs of, of addiction. Uh, it may also be that youths are, are more likely to fail, for, fail to account for some of the external costs of tobacco use. Uh, from their private consumption that is imposed on others. Now, there have been a number of, of policy strategies to, to curb smoking in general, but certainly youth smoking in, in particular, uh, some of which have been more effective than others, and, and some of which uh, have, have seen their effectiveness change over time. Uh, so, for instance, policies like clean indoor air laws, such as you know, banning smoking at, at schools. I was, was telling my graduate students yesterday that when I was attending high school on, on Long Island in the uh, early and mid-1990s, we still had a, a, a smoke shed out back in which some of the faculty at the high school would smoke with, their, with, uh, with, with the students of the school. And then they tore down the, 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 the shack and the, and the kids relocated just to the edge of campus near a guardrail on a busy road. So an early look as any re researcher sort of looked at how, 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 how clean indoor air loads might displace where smoking is happening and the unintended consequences of that. Uh, other policies have included uh, bans or restrictions, certainly on, on, on tobacco advertising. Uh, one of the more popular strategies to curb smoking has been increasing excise taxes on, on cigarettes. But there's evidence from the recent health economics literature that, that recent increases in cigarette taxes have been, have been less effective at deterring youth smoking than they were in the past. And we think this is in part because the marginal smoker has a more inelastic demand for, for cigarettes, which could suggest that other policy strategies are, are necessary uh, to deter smoking among the more hardcore types who gain the greatest utility from uh, cigarette consumption. We've also, of course, seen an explosion in the market for electronic cigarettes, particularly uh, flavored cigarettes, as an alternative source of, of nicotine for, for use, which has uh, gotten policymakers to uh, consider other, uh, other strategies to, to regulate this form of tobacco use. So that's included things like the imposition of a minimum legal purchasing age for e-cigarettes to, to 18, uh, or the imposition of electronic cigarette taxes. Uh, however, there's some evidence from Mike Pesco and his and his and his and Catherine and, and their colleagues that uh, there may be unintended consequences of uh, the imposition of electronic cigarette taxes uh, that may induce tobacco product substitution uh, towards cigarettes, which may have on net adverse uh, health health costs. So this brings us to uh, Tobacco 21 laws. Now, Tobacco 21 laws raise the minimum legal purchasing age for all tobacco products, so cigars, e-cigarettes, chew, cigarettes, uh, to age 21. Uh, one advantage of, of such a policy strategy is that it could circumvent problems with tobacco product substitution that are associated with policy, with, with policy initiatives that target one particular form of tobacco, resulting in this uh, product substitution. Uh, tobacco 21 laws are really popular. Uh, they enjoy the support of our major medical association, public health association, the institutes of medicine, uh, the American uh, Heart Association, the Cancer Society, the Lung Association, and uh, the American public widely support Tobacco 21 laws. Uh, Gallup polls show that three quarters of all adults, including about two thirds of smokers and three quarters of former smokers, uh, support uh, Tobacco 21 laws. Now, Tobacco 21 laws are, 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 are largely, for, for most states, uh, would raise the minimum legal purchasing age from 18 to, to 20, which raises the question, well, what's important about tobacco use among 18 to 20 year olds? Well, while we know that most adult smokers began experimenting uh, with tobacco uh, prior to age 14, the, the ages of 18 to 20 seem to be a, a critical ages on the path from experimental use uh, to everyday use and to, to addiction. So for instance, about 46% of adult smokers became everyday smokers before age 18, which is substantial, certainly, but 80% did so before age 21. So one argument for tobacco 21 laws is that by uh, limiting access to tobacco for those between the ages of 18 and 20, that could be a particularly effective strategy for uh, curtailing everyday use, sort of cutting off this path to addiction and, and increasing uh, successful quit attempts. It's important, I, I always think, to sort of put minimum legal purchasing age laws for uh, tobacco in, 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 a, in, a, in a longer history, lest people think these are sort of 
particularly radical current policies. The, the first minimum legal purchasing age for cigarettes was actually enacted in 1883 by the state of New Jersey, uh, which enacted a minimum legal purchasing age of 16 years old. And, and New York State followed a, a year later with a similar policy. Uh, by 1890, 26 states had minimum legal purchasing ages for cigarettes uh, ranging from 14 to 24. And you want to talk about radical policies. In 1895, uh, South Dakota banned all cigarette sales. Uh, by 1920, uh, all states uh, besides Ohio and Rhode Island had a minimum legal purchasing age for cigarettes. It was during the 1950s and 60s that uh, U.S.-based tobacco companies uh, led pretty successful lobbying efforts to uh, reduce the minimum legal purchasing age uh, for uh, cigarettes. Uh, there, there were some attempts during the Kennedy administration and Nixon administration for states to raise their minimum legal purchasing ages, which, which largely failed. Uh, in the more modern times, in, in 1992, the, the Sinara Amendment passed uh, requiring a, a state minimum legal purchasing age for cigarettes of, of at least 18 in order to receive uh, federal funding via, via SAMHSA. Um, and in that same year, Pennsylvania experimented with a minimum legal uh, sales age of, of, of 21 for cigarettes. And we had a handful of states, Alabama, Utah, and Alaska, with minimum legal purchasing ages of, for cigarettes of, of, of 19. A decade later, Pennsylvania repeals its uh, age 21 purchasing age. And sort of the modern age of, of tobacco 21 laws that we sort of talk about st started with the uh, adoption of local uh, tobacco 21 laws. Needham, Massachusetts in 2005 was the first to establish a, a local comprehensive uh, tobacco 21 law covering all tobacco products. Uh, the first statewide uh, laws uh, were passed in Hawaii and California in the year 2016. And of course, in late 2019, the Tobacco to 21 Act uh, was passed uh, by the Congress and signed into law by President Trump. Now, in terms of these comprehensive local Tobacco 21 laws that have, that have been adopted, over, over 500 municipalities raised their minimum legal purchasing ages uh, throughout the 2000s and 2000 uh, teens. Uh, but there was some, some concern that the localized nature of these statutes left uh, youths and, and young adults with a relatively low cost of evasion uh, by, by traveling to a, to a nearby town. And that's been one rationale offered uh, for statewide or even nationwide tobacco 21 laws uh, to, to increase the cost of being able to uh, avo avoid them. Um, now, between 2016 and 2019, uh, the District of Columbia and 16 additional states adopted these statewide Tobacco 21 laws. So, so the arguments for and against these, these laws in, in general are as follows. Uh, uh, the, the opponents of these laws argue, well, first, that they're going to be ineffective for the same reason raising cigarette excise taxes have been effective, that we're sort of down to the hardcore tobacco users uh, who have a, a very inelastic uh, demand for tobacco. So uh, they're going to find a way to, 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 to get their tobacco and these policies aren't going to nudge their behavior very much. Uh, second is an argument that it will uh, limit uh, the, the freedom of individuals ages 18 to 20, who many of whom may become rationally addicted to tobacco, in which case uh, such policies will be social welfare diminishing, uh, given the utility gains from those who choose to uh, become rationally addicted to tobacco. Uh, then there's more of an equity, I think, style argument in which opponents argue that, that these laws impose an, an unfair encroachment on freedom for those who are already making important decisions at ages 18 to 20 to serve in war, to vote, to make other uh, important decisions. And the argument is certainly they should be trusted to make decisions about their own uh, tobacco consumption. Now, now advocates of, of tobacco 21 laws uh, argue first uh, that there will be large public health benefits associated with their enactment in terms of reduced deaths, uh, uh, particularly due to cancers and heart disease, and a reduction in the average a number of, of uh, a, a, a reduction in the years cut short uh, from the use of, 
of tobacco. Uh, second, they argue that these statewide laws in particular um, are going to help uh, avoid spillovers, both in terms of evasion from the statutes and also, of course, in terms of product substitution, given that these Tobacco 21 laws are covering all forms of tobacco. A third important argument that you hear a lot from policymakers advocating Tobacco 21 is that they will reduce tobacco use among those under the age of 18. So the argument is that many younger teenagers, uh, minors, obtain uh, their tobacco from informal social markets, that is from third party purchase, from bumming or borrowing tobacco products, from stealing them or from getting uh, them some other way, including from 18 year old peers. Uh, so the argument is that uh, by limiting access uh, to tobacco from 18 year olds in particular, uh, often in the same high schools as these younger teenagers, that you'll dry up these social sources uh, for, for tobacco products. Uh, another argument is that by limiting access to tobacco among 18 year olds, uh, you'll generate some positive in terms of public health role modeling effects for uh, younger teenagers who are now no longer seeing uh, the 18 year olds uh, smoking as often in, the, in their school. Uh, there's also a practical argument that it's going to be more difficult to pull off sort of fake IDs for a 16 or 17 year old uh, uh, trying to obtain tobacco um, if uh, the minimum legal purchasing age of, of, is 21. It's easier to, 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 to perhaps uh, look like an 18-year-old an, an than it is for a 21-year-old if you're, if you're 16. So, so this argument about spillover effects, important spillover effects to minors, has been echoed by both proponents and, and opponents of, of tobacco 21 laws. So here's an argument from Mitch McConnell, uh, who's arguing in support of a federal tobacco to 21 uh, law, uh, in which he was arguing that one of the important reasons to raise the minimum legal purchasing age for tobacco was to get electronic cigarettes out of the hands of 18 year olds, because that would spill over and reduce electronic cigarette use among younger teens. Uh, on the other side, uh, a, a Philip Morris strategy brief that, that, that was released uh, had, had uh, the company ad admitting uh, that by raising the minimum legal purchasing age to 21, an important part of their uh, market would be a gutted that was not just 18 to 20 year olds, but 17 year olds as, as, as well. Um, so admission that spillover effects of these laws could be important. Uh, so there have been a number of prior studies that have looked at the impact of, of Tobacco 21 laws, and they largely fall in, in two categories, I would argue. Uh, first, uh, studies of, of local or municipal uh, Tobacco 21 laws, in which a Abby Friedman has played a, a prominent role in some, in some very cool studies. The, 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 the punchline from, from these papers has in general been that local Tobacco 21 laws do appear to be somewhat effective in reducing uh, tobacco use among 18 to 20 year olds, but that there's also evidence that these sort of spillover effects or evasion effects uh, may be substantial. Uh, for instance, they find that if, if a Tobacco 21 policy only partially covered a metropolitan or micropolitan statistical area, its effect on smoking behavior was about 60% smaller than if the statute uh, covered the entire uh, metropolitan or, or micropolitan statistical area. Uh, the second brand of studies have been, uh, in general, case studies of particular state Tobacco 21 laws, and they focused exclusively on Pennsylvania and California. The uh, study of Pennsylvania by Jan uh, looked at uh, smoking behavior among pregnant mothers uh, using a, a regression discontinuity design a, a, a around age 21. There could, so could be some concerns there, but they're also exploiting, some, she's also exploiting some of the temporal uh, temporal variation in, 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 in the repeal of the law as well. Um, and find some evidence that the Pennsylvania law reduced smoking behavior among, among pregnant mothers. The studies of California have largely been uh, either before or after estimators, or in one case, a synthetic control uh, estimate. There is some concern, and they found sort of conflicting results in this, in this literature. It's important also to note that California's Tobacco 21 law was also enacted with a, a, a bundle of other uh, tobacco control policies that it's not clear either of these research designs were, were able to sort of disentangle the effect of Tobacco 21 from these other uh, tobacco control policies.
So the contributions of, of this paper from, from uh, Ben, Drew, Cal, and I is, 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 is that we're going to be the first study uh, to examine the impact of, of statewide Tobacco 21 laws adopted nationwide on smoking behavior uh, and electronic cigarette use of 18 to 20 year olds. And we're also going to be the first to explore the spillover effects of these statewide statutes on minors uh, who rely heavily on the, on the social market uh, for tobacco products. Uh, we're going to be looking at the effect of these laws on electronic cigarette use at a, at a time when Juul is certainly exploding on the market. And we're going to descriptively explore how statewide tobacco 21 laws affect teenagers' use of the, of the social market for cigarettes. And then we'll conclude by looking at potential spillover effects of, of tobacco 21 laws on alcohol and marijuana use, uh, whose consumption may be uh, related to tobacco. So for our main sort of first stage uh, uh, estimates of the effects of uh, statewide tobacco 21 laws on tobacco use among 18 to 20 year olds, uh, we turn to the BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System uh, survey data between 2009 and 2019, focusing on about 95,000 individuals ages 18 to 20. And we're gonna measure a uh, first cigarette consumption uh, first, a measure of smoking participation, uh, a dichotomous uh, variable set equal to one if the respondents smoked at least 100 cigarettes in their lifetime and are current smokers. Uh, that is about 12% of 18 to 20 year olds over our sample period. Uh, and then everyday uh, smokers, that is those who smoked at least 100 cigarettes in their lifetime and now smoke every day, uh, that's about 7% of our 18 to 20 year olds. Uh, then we also measure uh, measure sort of uh, quote successful at least uh, current uh, quitters. Uh, we restrict our sample to those who had smoked at least 100 cigarettes in their lifetime, and then set this variable equal to one if they were not current smokers. Uh, so about 25 percent of 18 uh, to 20 year old. Uh, 18 to 20 year olds who'd smoked at least 100 cigarettes in their lifetime were now not current uh, smokers. Here, here are the trends in these measures in the BRFIS over our sample period. Uh, so we see both a smoking current smoking participation and, and current daily smoking participation uh, declining over the sample period and quit attempts among those who'd smoked 100 cigarettes in their lifetime uh, uh, increasing over time. And, and the research question we're asking is whether Tobacco 21 laws had anything to do with these trend, with these national trends that we are observing. So our first main empirical approach that we're going to use to identify the effects of, of Tobacco 21 laws is sort of a, a two-way fixed effects style difference in difference, a logit model, where our left-hand side variable is a zero-one indicator uh, for whether person I residing in state S and month M at year T is a current smoker or everyday smoker or has uh, quit uh, smoking. Uh, our key right-hand side variable is going to be an indicator for whether a statewide Tobacco 21 law was in effect. And then we're going to control for a wide vector of, 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 of variables that capture uh, demographic characteristics, uh, economic conditions at the state level, per capita state income, unemployment rate, and then other uh, tobacco policies enacted at the state level and changing over time, such as uh, excise taxes on cigarettes, clean indoor air laws, whether the state has imposed an electronic cigarette tax, uh, whether the state has a minimum legal purchasing age for electronic cigarettes of 18, and then also some uh, measures that capture uh, changes in the, in the effective price of, of maybe complements or substitutes uh, for tobacco, state beer taxes, whether there's a medical marijuana law and a recreational marijuana law, and then we control for state fixed effects, month fixed effects, year fixed effects, weight our regressions and, and cluster standard errors at the state level. So I believe this is one of our first pause points. Um, I, I think actually, if you don't mind doing one more slide and then we'll pause. Happy to do it. Okay, this is our, our where our identifying variation is coming from in Tobacco 21 laws. So we have 34 states, the white states, uh, who did not enact a statewide uh, Tobacco 21 law over the sample period. Uh, and then the darker colored states were the earliest adopters in 2016. So that is California and Hawaii, followed by New Jersey, 
uh, Massachusetts and, and Maine, and you can see the rest of the states that adopted later. So in total, we have 16 states in the District of Columbia uh, that have enacted statewide Tobacco 21 laws over this period. Great. Um, so let me remind uh, participants that they can ask any questions in the Q&A panel, so feel free to um, add some there. Before turning to the discussant, there's just one quick question in, um, that's been asked so far by Kathy Backinger, um, who I, I guess you were referred to the rational addiction model uh, earlier on. She's wondering, what does rationally addicted mean as it seems to be an oxymoron? So if you could just quickly uh, describe that. Sure, no, no, that, that, uh, so this is uh, Becker and Murphy had a, had a famous paper um, in the, I got this right, this is the QJE or the JP, I can't believe I've, 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 I've lost it, I think it's, it's JP, go ahead. Uh, uh, actually, I, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. I, I thought JP would. I thought, yeah, I thought so. I, I, I think so too. Anyway, a, a, a famous paper sort of arguing that individuals with sort of foresight to, to, to understand that the substance that they are consuming uh, could be an addictive substance might rationally choose, given the gain, given the utility gains that come with consumption of that good, may, may quite rationally choose to engage in its consumption, understanding that one of the future costs associated with it is addiction and the health costs that result for, from it, and are willing to sort of trade off those costs of future addiction uh, with the utility gains that come from consumption. Great. Uh, so, Catherine, maybe I'll, I'll turn to you uh, to see if you have any questions at this stage. I'm sure. Just a couple of quick questions for you, Joe. Sure. Um, I'm wondering, uh, in the data sets that you're utilizing, are you able to look at other tobacco products like uh, cigars that might be popular among youth? Uh, I didn't see that listed um, when you're going through outcomes, but maybe I missed it. So no, so what we what we focused on and what I'll present today are cigarettes and e-cigarettes. Um, there are some measures in the certainly in the YRBS um, where we could delve a bit more into. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a, yeah we we could delve a bit more into chew and uh, and potentially cigars. There are some differences in the state YRBS data in how this, how the question differs slightly sort of across states that creates some challenges in combining them. But yeah, we, we, we could, we, we don't in the version of the paper I'm gonna present today sort of look a lot at, at, at cigars and chuba crew. Thanks very much. Uh, just uh, another quick thought. Um, I guess I'm wondering, and I think it's beyond what you can probably do here in your data, but do you have any, any thoughts about how producers might respond to these to these laws, or I guess potentially many of the regulations that we are studying? That is what I'm thinking is there's sort of the idea that the products that uh, contain synthetic nicotine, which may not may or may not be subject to some of these laws. Do you anticipate that, that the youth market might be large enough to induce some of these sort of supply side changes that is uh, producers shifting the type of products that are available on the market. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So, so one of the things I sort of talk about, I'll talk about a little bit in the conclusion is 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 why we we think in the end the U.S. tobacco companies endorse Tobacco Twenty One laws, um, in part because of uh, we, we would argue if there's if this is kind of revealed preference about where there are additional profitable gains. Uh, to, to come from investment. So part, part of the trade-off in the conversation was about regulation of flavored electronic cigarettes versus uh, limiting the market to 18 to 20 year olds. And we think by, by endorsing tobacco to 21 laws sort of at the end that there was some notion that firms had alternative strategies kind of in mind that could be profitable with the availability of other types of tobacco products to use. So yes, I, in these current data sets, we certainly can't get at it, but, but, but absolutely is the answer. And I, and I think it was revealed in their decision to in, in, endorse the law at the end, the federal law. Fair point. 
Um, two more quick questions for you. Um, one, how do you think about quitting in the sample? I know you talked about sort of the progression into, um, into daily or frequent smoking, and you have sort of much of that occurring by 18 and by 20, um, even more so of the population that's going to smoke is smoking. How do you think about quitting in this younger adult population, in this, young, this younger population? It seems somewhat different than, uh, than adults. Uh, is it more of an experimentation or do you, are you thinking about really as quitting? Um, and my other quick question is, I have it written down here. Um, what do you think about the online market um, in particular for e-cigarettes? I know there's probably not much one can do empirically about that, but have you thought about how that might impact what you are able to capture um, in your data and if that's much of a concern? Sure, so, so first, yeah, so, so we don't have a long longitudinal panel to see how long-term successful kind of the quit behavior is. We also don't, we, we aren't able to sort of measure with it, whether this is sort of the quitting of experimental use versus sort of long time use. So this is, these are all big advantages that could come from future research that's using, and there are a few data sets out there, right? Uh, lo longitudinal data sets on, 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 on smoking behavior to try to, to try to discern yeah, what, what 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 type of quitting behavior is 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 happening? Un, un, unfortunately, given the limitations of the of, of of each of the data sets sort of work, that we're working with, we 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 are unsure whether we are capturing sort of the, the, the quitting of experimental use versus very frequent and, and, and heavy use. And it really is a mix, I, I think, um, given the, given, give, given what we know about the, 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 yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't, I, I, I ought not, I ought not speculate on, 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 on which types of quitters we're observing in the data, how, how limited it is. With regard to internet purchases, I think it's potentially really important, particularly given how uh, much less age verification is sort of going on for, for purchases uh, of electronic cigarettes online. Now, the YRBS data does include some information in terms of its social sources of uh, tobacco products. Of, of, of whether internet purchases are the usual way uh, through which uh, high school students are obtaining their uh, electronic cigarettes. So we can, we can start, so we, we that, that the, well, it, it's part of why when I listed in the contributions, this is pretty descriptive. This, this question on uh, usual sources of electronic cigarettes is, is new in the YRBS, just starting in 2017. Um, but this internet category is, is, is there and, and we think likely to, to grow. So there, there is going to be some that national data that includes information on, on, on internet purposes and will it purchases and will give you some, uh, some descriptive, a descriptive look of how its use has changed over time. So I, I think uh, one so more uh, quick question uh, from the audience, and then we'll, we'll keep things moving. Um, Wendy Max asks, uh, does the model consider local Tobacco 21 laws or just state level of laws? Uh, we're going to we're going to do both. The first set of so the results I'm about to show you are statewide laws, and then we're going to incorporate local laws, and we'll show you how the effects differ. Okay, great. Um, well, why don't we keep moving? Um, sure. Sounds good. So here are our first set of, of estimates. So these are the effects of statewide Tobacco 21 laws using our sort of two-way fixed effect style uh, loaded estimates. So here we're focusing on 18 to 20 year olds. Uh, each of the three columns just represent different subsets of controls. The more parsimonious model is our is in, is in column one. Then we add that that includes socioeconomic and cigarette policy controls as well as our fixed effects. Then we include e-cigarette policy controls in column two, and column three adds the uh, uh, policies that that capture changes in the prices of, of potentially substitutes and complements. So what we find is that the enactment of a, a statewide tobacco 21 law is associated with about a, a two to four percentage point decline in smoking participation among 18 year olds. Okay, uh, so this is about at least a 20 percent decline relative to the pre-treatment um, uh, mean of the dependent variable in, in states that adopt tobacco 21 laws. Um, we also find that the enactment of, of, of statewide laws reduces everyday smoking by about uh, one and a half to two and a half uh, percentage points. 
while imprecisely estimated, we do find some evidence that that, that Tobacco 21 laws are associated with an, with an increase in the uh, probability of quote, successful uh, quit attempts. So this pattern of results suggests that these statewide Tobacco 21 laws have been effective at reducing cigarette use uh, among 18 to 20 year olds. Uh, this is our uh, event study analysis, uh, one of the tests of, of, of the common trends assumption. So we find very little evidence that prior to the adoption of statewide tobacco 21 laws uh, that uh, cigarette use among 18 year olds in treatment and control states was, was trending any differently. The break in trend follows uh, the enactment of, of tobacco 21 laws. Now, uh, we all know, a, a lot of economists sort of know uh, that there is an ongoing conversation in the difference in difference literature about whether two-way fixed effect style difference in difference estimates are gonna produce uh, unbiased estimates of the treatment effect in the presence of, of dynamic treatment effects or heterogeneous treatment effects by adoption timing. This is a critique that's been uh, brought up by, by Andrew uh, Goodman-Bacon. I'm not sure why in this circumstance we expect this to be a major uh, uh, concern. We, we've got 34 states that do not adopt tobacco 21 laws and I'm not quite clear why tobacco 21 laws should have important dynamic treatment effects uh, over time, but but that said, I won't fight the wind. Um, so so we we focus uh, we we employ a stack difference in difference estimate to to deal with this potential concern. We focus on a more closely balanced panel and event time of four years of leads and up to a one year of, of of lagged effects. And so each stack is going to be comprised of states that implemented a Tobacco 21 law in the same month and year, and a set of counterfactual states that never implemented a Tobacco 21 law. Uh, we also e e explored the use of not yet adopting states and get a similar pattern of results, uh, what I'm going to show you, and we'll estimate a regression that includes stacks specific state and time effects, as well as the uh, controls described above. And in the main, we find a similar pattern of, of, of results that the enactment of a statewide tobacco 21 law is associated with about a four percentage point decline in smoking participation and about a one and one and a half percentage point decline in, in everyday smoking. The magnitudes on the effects of quitting are smaller, though also pretty imprecisely estimated as well. Um, so we view this pattern of results as suggestive of that we ought not be too worried about, about the about a, a dynamic treatment effects here leading to biased estimates. Here's our stacked difference in difference event study, which is pretty similar to the event study that we produced with our two-way fixed effect style model. Uh, next, we sort of take a look at whether it's possible that the enact that a state's enactment of to a tobacco 21 law is just an observable marker for other policies that are getting enacted or, or, or tobacco use uh, a sentiment that's changing over time that could be affecting smoking among all age groups. And, and maybe we're not picking up an effect of tobacco 21 laws on, on cigarette use among 18 to 20 year olds, but maybe we're just picking up something else correlated with those laws that uh, would, 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 would affect smoking behavior among others. So what we do is we turn to uh, 21 to 23 year olds and 24 to 28 year olds to see if tobacco 21 laws affected the smoking behavior of, of those age uh, groups. And we don't find much evidence uh, of that. Now, these are not perfect falsification style tests because some 21 to 23 year olds could have had their longer run smoking behavior affected with a lag uh, if tobacco 21 laws were in effect in their state when they were younger and were bound by the law. We don't find too much evidence of that. Over our sample period, 24 to 28 year olds are actually never uh, affected by tobacco 21 laws, just given our, given our uh, window. And these are our, our, our triple difference sort of loaded estimates. So the interaction of the tobacco, so here we pool a sample of 18 to 20 year olds and 21 to 23 year olds and have an indicator of whether this uh, observation is drawn from an 18 to 20 year old interacted with the treatment effect. And what we find is that the enactment of a tobacco 21 law is associated with about a, a, a four percentage point a uh, larger decline in smoking participation among 18 to 20 year olds relative to 20 
uh, 21 to 23 year olds. Uh, also as a, 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 an added reduction in, in everyday smoking. In, in the second column here, we actually include a full set of state by year fixed effects. So this will control for any unmeasured state policies uh, that could be uh, correlated with changes in cigarette use among 18 to 20 and 21 to 23 year olds. So this is pretty powerful in the sense of, 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 of the kinds of unobserved heterogeneity that are being controlled for. And we still find that tobacco 21 laws are associated with a, with a uh, reduction in the smoking behavior of 18 to 20 year olds relative to 21 to 23 year olds. And here's our event study analysis of this uh, triple difference estimate. Again, uh, in general, kind of indicates a fairly common pre-trends with the break in trend for 18 to 20 year olds relative to 21 to 23 year olds seen in the post-treatment period. Uh, what if instead of using age to define treatment, we used birth year, birth cohort to define a treatment? This essentially would allow those who are uh, over the age of 20 to have had their cigarette consumption affected if tobacco 21 laws were effective in, 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 in stopping them on their path to addiction when they were ages 18 to 20 in the state, basically allowing longer run effects of tobacco 21 laws uh, for, for, for those who were 18 to 20 when the statute was uh, passed. So when we use sort of birth year relative uh, to the timing of the adoption of a tobacco 21 law in the state to define treatment, uh, we continue to find evidence that tobacco 21 laws reduce uh, smoking behavior among affected uh, birth cohorts. So th this question that was raised earlier about, about statewide laws versus uh, local laws. So we've been just showing you the effect of statewide laws. In panel one here, uh, we amend our, our, our treatment variable to now incorporate the local uh, laws. Uh, we don't have in our version of the BRFIS the local identifying information. Uh, so we're looking, we're using the share of the, of the state population that was covered by these local laws. Um, to help define treatment. And, and, and what we find sort of in, in general, we, we still find evidence that, you know, whether it's local or state tobacco 21 laws are negatively related to uh, smoking participation, but, but the marginal effects are, are, are smaller in absolute magnitude, particularly for everyday smoking. And we see why we, we think here, uh, when we separate the effects of state and local tobacco 21 laws, uh, we find that the effects on smoking behavior are much bigger for the statewide laws relative uh, to the local laws. There actually should be a star there on everyday smoking for uh, statewide laws as, as, as well. And so this is consistent with the hypothesis uh, that local laws are much more easily uh, evaded by people able to travel to a, a neighboring town. Uh, you know, cross-border shop, cross-state border shopping is also possible, but the costs are higher, certainly if you don't live near uh, the state border. So this is indicative of statewide laws being more effective at reducing uh, tobacco use. What about border state policies? Do they matter? Do the effect of a tobacco 21 law, is it, is it bigger um, if, you, if a border state also has a tobacco 21 law? We don't find much evidence of that for smoking participation. For everyday smoking, uh, you know, more evidence, at least the, the coefficient on the interaction between a tobacco 21 law and a border state tobacco 21 law is still is, is substantial. So there could be some evidence there that, 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 that border states policies um, matter as well. The Burfus asked questions about electronic cigarette participation for, for a limited window beginning in 2016. Um, so in this table, we present uh, estimates to, to show you whether there's age-specific heterogeneity in the effects of statewide tobacco 21 laws by 18-year-olds versus 19 to 20-year-olds. And we also look at, at this a measure of electronic cigarette participation. And what we find first is that the effects of tobacco 21 laws seem bigger among 18 year olds as compared to 19 and 20 year olds. And we also find that these laws are effective at reducing e-cigarette participation uh, driven by 18 year olds. So these laws appear to be effective at reducing not just cigarette consumption, but, but at least this one other form of tobacco consumption, which we can measure in the, in the BRFIS. 
Uh, here we look at some demographic heterogeneity in the effects of Tobacco 21 laws on, on, on smoking participation. And in general, we find effects for males and females, whites and blacks, not so much for those other races, but we find bigger effects uh, for less educated individuals, that is those without a high school degree relative to having a high school degree, and slightly larger effects for those living in households with incomes uh, below the poverty line than above the poverty line. So some of the less educated, uh, poorer individuals, we see uh, evidence that Tobacco 21 laws seem to be more effective at reducing smoking. Just another break period. Uh, yeah, why don't we... Uh take a, another uh, pause there. So uh, just a, a couple of quick questions because I know you still have some uh, material to cover. One is the question of does smoking include vaping when you're um, discussing your outcomes? Uh, no, sorry, sorry. For my for the, the the first main set of outcomes is just cigarette consumption. This last slide that I had dealing with electronic cigarette participation is is uh, is is what's going to pick up vaping. Great. And another person asked, uh, were you able to control for or look at the role of marijuana related policies um, that have coincided, may have coincided with T21 laws? Yes. Yeah, so we include controls for, for both medical marijuana laws and recreational uh, marijuana laws here. Great. Um, so let me see, Catherine, do you have any uh, other questions at this stage? I just have a couple of quick ones and, and then um, I'll share them with you later, Joe. Uh, one, I, I agree with you that perhaps in this setting that we may not expect so much of the heterogeneity from uh, the bias from heterogeneity across these states. Um, my, it might be nice just to kind of to hone in on that argument. You could perhaps show the decomposition suggested by Bacon Goodman to kind of prove the point that perhaps what yep. showing us what shared your yep. variation. Not hard sure. to do. I know you guys are, yep. these folks are teched up enough to do that. Just because another issue that's in the back of my mind when I think about this new literature that is very challenging to keep up with, I am not clear. Um, if, if it's been generalized to the nonlinear setting. So I'm not sure how yeah. important that is. I just know that my intuition from linear to nonlinear models is not great, uh, but that's just something I had in the back of my mind. And another issue that I thought um, I'd be happy to send you the site is you're dealing with this cross-border uh, smuggling, which I'm, I think that's great that you're doing that. Uh, there's a really nice way that kind of maximizes efficiency. Um, Kyle Butts has a paper uh, that he sort of generalized how we can how we can better do this than I know at least the rather crude ways I've attempted to do this. And also perhaps not imp as important in your context, but also not only helping you identify the treatment effect on the targeted locality um, more accurately, we can also look over to this, you can estimate the spillovers to surrounding areas. I'm not quite clear if this is really a setting where that might occur, but it might be something that you may wish to consider. I have some other comments, but I'll, I'll share them with you. But. Thank you, Catherine. That's a that's a that's a really good suggestion, and I'm with you on the on the especially with these new methods about the transition from 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 linear to nonlinear models. The way we've largely sort of done it here is to to estimate linear probability models in addition to the logit models, and we've shown the sort of the yeah. Also the same and then sort of extrapolate that to like, for instance, a Goodman Bacon decomposition, I think has to be linearly done. I think but so. Yeah. From what, from what Scott Cunningham has, to, has, has told me, so he's my, he's my interpreter of the, of, 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 for, for, for this, for, for this literature is that, yeah, there's no reason sort of in principle that these nonlinear models of logits and poissons and so on can't be sort of brought to the, even the Callaway Santana sort of style estimators. But right now I'm not clear on what the technology is for the implementation of those sort of beyond the, 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 the R code and Stata code that have, be, that have become available. So I, I yeah, that, that's the way I've tried to sort of to translate the nonlinear to linear models to apply to that, to that world. Great, so, yeah. Joe, thanks so much. Yeah, sure. thanks Joe, uh, why, don't, why don't we keep going then? Okay, sure. Uh, so next we turn to a, a supplemental data set from the uh, state youth risk behavior surveys between 2009 and 2019. So these are uh, surveys are designed to be representative of, of risky behaviors, including tobacco use among state uh, at the state level of, of, of high school students, and it can be weighted uh, by this by CIR weights to produce nationally representative estimates. So what we're going to do first is impact, estimate the impact of statewide Tobacco 21 laws on 18-year-old high school students who will be directly bound by the by, by, by the statewide Tobacco 21 laws to see if we get results similar to the BRFIS. But the two big advantages that we're moving toward is one, to examine spillovers to youths under the age of 18 who rely more heavily on the informal market for tobacco, specifically 16 to 17 year olds who are in the same schools uh, as these 18 year olds. This is a school-based survey. 
Um, and, and then second, to descriptively explore whether Tobacco 21 laws affects uh, usual sources of electronic cigarettes. So the first set of outcomes we're going to focus on are cigarette use, smoking participation, frequent smoking, which is 20 or more days in the last month, and, and everyday smoking. So here are the results for 18-year-olds from our two-way fixed effects model. Uh, so we find uh, evidence that the adoption of, of statewide Tobacco 21 laws are associated with significant reductions in smoking participation, well, it's marginal there, uh, stronger evidence for declines in frequent and everyday smoking. So in the BRFIS for our 18-year-old high school students, we, we certainly find bigger effects of statewide tobacco 21 laws, like kind of on the in, more intensive margin of cigarette consumption in this group. Um, so, but again, pretty consistent evidence that these uh, policies are are effective at reducing tobacco use among the among the age groups it's designed to affect. And this is our stacked difference in difference logit models using the YRBS, which produce in general a, a similar pattern of 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 results. This is heterogeneity in the in the state YRBS by uh, gender and 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 race. In, in the YRBS, we have stronger evidence that statewide tobacco twenty one laws affect, affect cigarette consumption more among men than women. Uh, and by race, it's it's you know there's not a sort of clear clear pattern of whether whites or, or blacks see sort of big, bigger effects, but but a, a clear pattern that for men uh, the effects are 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 bigger. So here's one of our first, uh, you know, important results about why we, we turned to the state YRBS was to look at spillovers to minors. And we do find some evidence that the adoption of statewide tobacco 21 laws are reducing smoking participation among 16 to 17 year old youth, about a three percentage point uh, reduction in cigarette, current cigarette use among 16 to 17 year olds. So this is an important spillover effect of these laws that were, 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 were argued by by proponents. Uh, we find effects for, for males and females uh, and uh, uh, somewhat larger effects for, for whites, but just less precisely estimated for, for blacks. For the more intensive margin of, of smoking behavior among 16 to 17 year olds, the effects are clearly larger for whites. So we view this pattern of results as at least indicative of their potentially being important spillover effects of tobacco 21 to uh, minors. Um, what about effects on 14 to 15 year olds? We don't now, now you know, s s the rates of smoking participation are certainly much lower among this uh, group. And, and, and so it's going to be very difficult to detect uh, significant effects, significant marginal effects, given that fact. But we don't find evidence uh, that tobacco 21 laws significantly affect smoking use among 14 to 15 year olds. We think this may also be reflective of the fact that 18 year olds are much less likely to be in the peer group of 14 to 15 year olds than are 16 to 17 year olds in their high school. Turning to e-cigarette consumption, uh, we find that statewide tobacco 21 laws are, are negatively related to electronic cigarette participation among 18 year olds. We find it at both the participation margin and for uh, frequent and everyday electronic cigarette use. Here, we don't find much evidence of spillover effects to 16 to 17 year olds. We, we, we don't find much evidence at all that uh, Tobacco 21 is keeping electronic cigarettes out of the hands of 16 to 17 year olds. So those spillovers uh, seem uh, to be uh, seen most, most strongly for uh, cigarettes. This is our measures of usual sources of, of cigarettes, which we have some data in, in 2017 and 2019 Burfus, I'm sorry, YRBS. So looking at the far left uh, set of bars under, under use, the darker uh, uh, bars represent uh, control states, electronic cigarette use among 18 year olds. The lighter bars are the tobacco 21 enacting states. What you see is that across all states between 2017 and 2019, uh, there are big increases in electronic cigarette use among 18 year olds. This is the time of the explosion of Juul on the market. But what you also see is that the increase in electronic cigarette use is smaller among Tobacco 21 enacting states than among control states. And that's that marginal effect we just uh, detected of Tobacco 21 being negatively related uh, to e-cigarette use among 18-year-olds. When we look at effects 
uh, by usual manner in which 18 year olds obtain their electronic cigarettes, we find that this effect is driven almost entirely by uh, direct purchase uh, effects. That is that the increase in direct purchase of electronic cigarettes is much smaller, the increase among tobacco 21 enacting states than in our control states. So these laws are, seem to be uh, effective at reducing the ability of 18 year olds to directly purchase their cigarettes. But looking at other sources by which 18 year olds get their electronic cigarettes, what you can see is a relative increase, for instance, in the bumming and borrowing of electronic cigarettes relative to the control states, and also some evidence of a relative increase in, 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 in third party purchase. Also, uh, while, it, while it's, you know, uh, yeah, so, so I'll, 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 I'll leave it there to suggest that the, the informal social market may provide one means of, of, of blunting the net impacts of Tobacco 21 laws that turning to increases in bumming or borrowing could suggest a, a different uh, uh, implicit price pass through uh, for direct purchase and the social market uh, for the enactment of, of these laws on the sort of shadow price of, of tobacco. Uh, it, the results are even more striking when you look among men where we find that our effects were, 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 were driven. So he, here we find that you know, uh, net direct purchases among men of electronic cigarettes for 18 year olds actually falls following the adoption of tobacco 21 laws so, and while it rises in control states. So that's where the reduction in e-cigarette use is coming. But the reduction isn't as big as it might have been to the extent that some of these 18 year olds are able to turn to uh, bumming and borrowing electronic uh, cigarettes. And that's what appears to be happening. We do estimate a formal kind of multinomial logit model across where the sort of omitted outcome category is, 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 is non-consumption. And we find indeed tobacco 21 laws effective at reducing direct purchase, but some of this is being offset by an increase in a uh, borrowing of electronic cigarettes. So this is descriptive, uh, in part because we only have a few waves of YRBS data to look at, but it, it, it certainly, I think, sort of a very important area for future research on Tobacco 21 laws in thinking about how youths are adjusting to potentially major changes in the access to tobacco. And looking at just uh, sales by vendors isn't going to be enough uh, to pick up exactly what's going on in the market for electronic cigarettes among uh, youths. Uh, turning to, to close here about substitutes or complements potentially to tobacco, uh, we find uh, evidence that statewide tobacco 21 laws uh, are associated with a reduction in uh, marijuana use and frequent marijuana use among 18 year old uh, high school students, reflecting that marijuana and the tobacco products that are affected by tobacco 21 may be complements. This may be because uh, marijuana and cigarettes are consumed together as a spliff, or there's a, a common uh, delivery of these products uh, via uh, vaping uh, type strategies uh, for, for both marijuana and electronic cigarettes. We also find some evidence on the intensive margin that uh, tobacco products affected by tobacco 21 laws and alcohol may be complements, where we find evidence that these laws are negatively related to alcohol use on the intensive margin. And that's true in both the YRBS data among 18-year-olds and also in the BRFIS among 18 to 20-year-olds, where we find the number of days of alcohol use and the number of days of alcohol use conditional on drinking are negatively affected, particularly among males. So I'll conclude with, so some may ask who cares, uh, some have, right? We, we have a federal tobacco to 21 act passed in, in December, 2019. I mean, I know this group cares, but, but some policy people say, well, we've got a federal law now. Why do we, why, you know, what's, what's, what's the point of, of past policy analysis on statewide policies? Well, it, it's gonna be at least somewhat difficult to disentangle uh, the effects of the federal tobacco to 21 law which hasn't yet been fully implemented, uh, from, from heterogeneous effects of the COVID-19 pandemic across states where it did not did not bind and where smoking behavior may clearly be, a, and tobacco use behavior may be clearly affected by COVID as well. So, so one can argue, and we are, that this study may provide very important and perhaps the best evidence we're going to get uh, on the effects 
of, of large scale tobacco 21 laws adopted across states and, and potentially to generalize across the nation. So our, our results provide pretty strong evidence that statewide tobacco 21 laws are associated with important reductions in tobacco use among 18 to 20 year olds, including both traditional cigarettes and e-cigarettes, some evidence of spillovers to minors, to 16 to 17 year olds, particularly for cigarettes, and some suggestive evidence, definitely worthy of future work, that access to the informal social market may blunt the impact of tobacco 21 laws on e-cigarette use among some 18 year olds. Now, the U.S. is at present uh, in, in, in interesting sort of company in terms of uh, countries that have nationwide tobacco 21 laws, and whether the results we find here are going to generalize to other nations, particularly OECD countries that could consider such policies that have much higher rates of, 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 of smoking. Uh, it's, it's, it's unclear uh, wh whether the marginal effects we find for U.S. states are going to generalize to some of these countries. Clearly, the effects of tobacco 21 laws are going to vary with a number of other factors, including enforcement, uh, the extent to which auditing programs are effective in verifying compliance with age requirements, in terms of the magnitudes of the fines, in terms of how internet purchases, where, where age verification is, 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 is less, serves as a substitute for traditional uh, vendors. And, and as I was mentioning in my, in my discussion with, 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 with Catherine, in, in US-based tobacco companies that endorsed the federal tobacco to 21 law in the end, uh, we think this is, is probably at least in part to avoid regulation of flavored tobacco products. So revealed preference suggests that tobacco companies believe that there were greater profits associated with the less regulation of e-cigarettes and that they were willing to forego uh, some of the sales to 18 to 20 year olds uh, for the, 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 the re retention of, and, and gaining of futured smokers through the use of flavored e-cigarettes. Uh, so, so there clearly been, are, have been and continue to be dramatic changes in the tobacco market that are going to be really important for thinking about designing optimal uh, future policy. You know, advertising and targeting of youths has moved to social media. The distribution of these new tobacco products has moved to online markets. So the, the long-run impacts of Tobacco 21 and whether it is a long-run public health success is going to depend in part how other policy responds to these changes in markets and technological developments, which are going to affect both enforcement of Tobacco 21, but also the ability for evasion. So thank you so much for the opportunity to present this work, and I look forward to further questions. That was fantastic. So I, I think we're almost out of time, or are out of time, but okay. I'll, I'll do one quick audience question, um, and that was asking about um, whether you accounted for substitution of e-cigarettes for combustible tobacco products and how that would affect your uh, results. No, so we, 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 we are only looking at, yeah, net, net use of the particular product we look at, which, which across both these data sets, the tobacco products we focused on are just e-cigarettes and, and, and cigarettes. Um, as I mentioned in my conversation with Catherine before, we can look at so we, we can take a deeper look at cigars and 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 chew, but yeah, that there are other products to which substitution is happening that we cannot measure in these data is 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 possible. So I, I, I'm certainly not arguing that in this that in this paper we're we're able to measure all of the different types of tobacco products whose consumption could be affected by the law. Right. Okay. And what we'll, actually I'll, I'll do one final question. So um, sure. it's a question about uh, measure potential measurement error for uh, outcomes. And so uh, how big is the impact of probable fear of confessing uh, of confessing a forbidden behavior and uh, how that might affect your results or if you accounted for that in any way? So yeah, I mean, I, I think that I, I think that's interesting. If you if you if one um, th thinks that the the so so the the kind of measurement error we're we're especially worried about is that correlated with the adoption of tobacco twenty one. So if if the the adoption of these laws creates a as 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 the questioner says, sort of a, a less willingness to report use. Uh, it's po it's possible there that there 
that there could be some concern. I mean, part, part, yeah, I mean, the, the, the only, yeah, the only way to sort of supplement sur survey data to get around this is looking at, say, is looking at sales data or, or Nielsen data, right? Uh, um, which is, which, you know, could, 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 could capture some measures of direct sales, but yeah, no, it's a fair point. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you, Dr. Sapia, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 155 people for your participation. Thanks again for participating and have a top snatch weekend.